Ephesians chapter 6. Let's start at verse 13. The Bible reads, Wherefore take unto you of the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall, uh, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit tonight. Lord, I pray that, uh, that we, you would give us ears to hear your word, that your word would fall upon fertile soil upon our hearts. And Lord, that we do not just be hearers of your word, but doers of the word as well. And Lord, we thank you. And Lord, I pray that you would give me strength to be able to preach your word, that it would be as a fire shut up in my bones. And Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. As you know, that over the past you know, a month and a half or so, uh, almost two months now, we've been going through the different aspects, the different you know, uh, pieces in the whole armor of God. In the whole armor of God. Now, this is obviously the final piece of the whole armor of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. So, but I'm going to go through, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to go through a quick recap of all the stuff we talked about. I know every single sermon that I've done over this past, you know, uh, over this past almost two months, you know, I've reminded us, but obviously repetition is the way that we remember, right? And so that's why we, uh, you know, that's why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it just because I want to, you know, I want to fill time, okay? The belt of truth you know, speaks of life that is built upon the faithfulness to the, uh, to the word of God and to the God of the word, right? It speaks of our being, uh, of our being uh, truth in both our testimony and living it. The belt of truth, remember, gives us stability so that we are able to stand. The belt of truth also provides a place for the, all the other pieces, or for, sorry, for the other pieces uh, of the armor to rest. Without the belt of truth, everything falls apart. Nothing, you know, uh, is able to stand. So number one is that fact of that we, our life is built upon the faithfulness of the word of God and to the God of the Word. Why? Because we know that Jesus Christ is the living Word. He, you know, God, you know, He came in the flesh, you know, His Word dwelt, dwelt among us. Who is that? Jesus Christ. So if we, uh, you know, if our life is built upon that faithfulness, everything else is going to be there. It's going to provide stability for everything else that we have. The breastplate of righteousness is, it speaks of that holy life that we have. It speaks of a life that is lived in conformity to God's word. That we don't just read God's word, but we actually conform to it and say, God, you know what? I want to be like your word says. I want to be, you know, I want to be like Jesus, basically. A holy life is a powerful defense against the attacks of the enemy. We got to remember that when we allow sin into our life, it gives place to the devil. When we allow sin to dwell in our life, it gives place to the devil, it gives place to the enemy, to where he is able to attack us and exploit that weakness that we have. Because sin is going to weaken us. The boots of peace speak of our foundation in Jesus Christ, right? When our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, it means that we are saved by grace and that we stand in infir- uh, infirm. Uh, sorry, we stand firm in that knowledge that we know that we are saved by grace through faith, right? And that nothing is going to shake us. You know, shake us in that. That we are. That's what. The, that's our foundation. We stand upon that. We know that you know that we are saved by grace through faith, and that Satan's going to you know wants us to. He's gonna, he's going to attempt to make us doubt, right? Because oftentimes we go off of feelings, and we can't go off of feelings. We need to go off of what His Word says, because our feelings will change, our feelings will, you know, will shift, everything else. You know, one day we feel great, the next day we don't, right? One day we feel saved, the next day we don't. But uh, when we wear the, uh, the, uh, belts, uh, sorry, the boots of peace, we are sure and secure in our salvation, and we cannot be moved. We won't be moved no matter what. Why? Because we're sure of our salvation. We know that God gave it to us, and nothing can take it away from us. Nothing. The shield of faith speaks of a simple faith in God that allows us to trust Him at all times, in all situations. And and you may be sitting there saying, Pastor, you're saying the same things over and over again. But the thing is, is that how often do we doubt these things? There's a reason why Satan attacks these areas. 
that if that if we you know if we don't you know uh, you know base our life off of the, you know the belt of truth you know of 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 that truth of you know of where that stability is you know like the belt of truth and the fact that God you know the faithfulness of God and the you know and and uh, to the God of the Word then what's going to happen? We think you know sometimes that God's going to fail us, don't we? There's times where we've you know, if you're like, you know, like me, you know, I sat there and you know, for a moment, because life wasn't going well, I said, you know, did God finally, you know, did God fail me? No, that's feeling. His word says that he will never fail us. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us. He's, he, he's not going to lose. And so when we realize those things and in, in going, you know, to, to the breastplate, uh, breastplate of righteousness, like I just talked about, we got to make sure that we are living a holy life so we don't allow sin to dwell, to remain in us, right? So when we, when we mess up, when we sin, what do we do? We, we confess our sin. Why? Because he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But we often, how often do we forget that? Because we'll sit there and say, you know, I am the only person who has ever had an issue like this. That's what Satan wants you to think. See, it wants you to think that you're the only one that has ever had a problem in whatever area that it is. But in reality, we've all had you know uh, issues. We've all had the same issues at times and everything else. There's all things that we've we uh, you know we struggle with. That's why we have the body of Christ, right? Because when we have those things that oftentimes that we think that we're all by ourselves, we can go to somebody else and say, you know what? And they know. They say, you know what? This is how I beat it. The fact of, you know, the boots of, you know, peace is the fact that we are sure of our salvation. It doesn't rely upon us. It doesn't rely upon us. It, reply, it relies upon him. And he already said that he's not going to take it away from us, that no one's going to ever be able to pluck, him, you know, pluck you out of his hand, that nothing can, you know, separate us from the love of Christ. That's why oftentimes you'll have people say, well, you know, I think I finally found the one thing that God is, you know, going to be, you know, he's never going to forgive me for. If you're a believer in Christ, there is forgiveness. No matter what it is that you've done. Read the Old Testament. There's some there's quite a few, and you know, there's quite a few in the Old Testament that you say, man, they they messed up. But God forgave them. Yeah. Th- yes. Well, and you'll have you'll have Here's the thing, you'll have saved and unsaved, Satan will use to try and, that'll be one of those fiery darts that will come, you know, come to you. Satan doesn't all, I mean, he always looks for, you know, like I said, he's always looking for that, you know, that area in your life where he can exploit it. And he's always sitting there, you know, whatever. And I mean, think about Job. Think about Job. Job, you know, was, you know, God said that he was right in it, you know, uh, in his sight, that he did everything well. And the three, his three friends were saved. Yet everything about them, you know, was not true, you know, that they said to him. And like we talked about last week, he had the helmet of salvation on. He had that full assurance, you know, that he was, you know, and he never allowed what they were saying to actually get in there and make him doubt things. So he had that helmet of salvation in, you know, upon his head to where they could not penetrate it. I mean, they were saved. His wife was saved. And what did she say? Just curse God and die. Because she, you know, and that's, the, you know, the thing is, is that uh, they will, you know, Satan will use saved and unsaved people. Because you know what? What happens is, you may be having a bad day. Well, so is that un- you know, so is that saved person. They're having a bad day, and some you know they may lash out at you. There's that dart going right for you. And are you, are you, do you have the full armor of God in place to to where Satan cannot exploit you? Where you get to sit there and say, you know what? And we're going to go through what the sword of the spirit is here in a moment. But that's the, what we need to realize is that we need to have these things in place so that way when somebody says something to us, it doesn't it it doesn't make us drop to our knees. Mm-hmm. 
they're not using it. That's the reason why he says that, you know, to, uh, you know oh, you're all right. That's the reason why. Because he, t- he had it on, they didn't. Because, you know, if they did, they would have, you know, realized the things that they were saying were not true. Well, God spoke to them at the end, basically told them to get their life right. Because the things you're saying were only, because the things, not you, but the things that they were saying were not right. Because God restored everything unto Job. You know, and I'm not saying that obviously the fact, I mean, he restored, restored, you know, everything that, you know, that he had, you know, and everything else. Obviously, you can't replace, you know, children, but he did restore everything. And he did have more children after that, not saying that he, like, completely forgot the fact of those. And his kids were saved, too. And God took them. Because, you know, the fact is, is that God will allow things in your life. He doesn't cause them. He allows them. Just remember, Satan had to ask God for permission. That's what something, you know, at times people don't want to realize, is that Satan can't do anything without the Lord's permission. And so God will allow things. He doesn't cause it. He just says, I'll allow it. Why? Because if you didn't, if God wasn't allowing things in your life, there would never be any reason for you to overcome. There would never be a reason for you to even strive for victory in your life. There would never be a reason for you to put on the full armor of God. I mean, then, he, then we could just erase that part, you know, in Ephesians, you know, 6. But, you know, he knows that we are fighting, you know, an enemy. He knows that, you know, whatever, and Satan, you know, will sit there, and he gets joy out of, you know, causing doubt and, and disappointment and all these discouraging believers and everything else. Because if he can't take you out, because if he can't have your soul, if he can't have those things, he's going to try and nullify those things in your life. He's going to try and, you know, uh, kick you to the sidelines so that way you're not in the game. He doesn't want you in battle. He wants you sitting at a desk, you know, uh, you know, back, you know, you know, behind, way behind enemy, line, enemy lines so you're not even in the battle, you're not even in the fight. But God says, you know what, put on the whole armor of God and do it because he says every believer is in this fight. Every believer is, uh, is to do this, Right? Make sense? Okay. I just want to make sure. I want to make sure before we go on. Yeah, I do. That's what I'm here for. But the shield of faith, as we talked about, is, is the fact uh, that God allows us to trust him at all times and in all situations. When the good times come, the just shall live by faith. When the, uh, the bad times come, the just shall live by faith. Remember that uh, the shield of faith is like the size of like a, a door. So when those things come over, he's able, you know, you're able to like just take down all, every single one of those darts that you're not going to, you know, get hit. And don't let one, uh, you know, slip through. The helmet of salvation, you know, we kind of talked about for a moment, uh, you know, is the fact that Satan will come at, uh, at us with a double-edged sword of discouragement and doubt. He wants us to make, uh, make us insecure about our relationship with the Lord. He wants us, you know, to become easy prey. But yet, you know what? We are confident that we are that we are saved in Jesus, and we have the ability to stand for Him, even when Satan and his armies attack us. So we even uh, you know the helmet of salvation is the fact of that full assurance of our salvation. Over and over again, God is saying, you know what? There's more to your salvation than what you think. But the thing is, your salvation is everything. It is your salvation is. Oftentimes people say, well, I got saved back or whatever, and they think that at that time they just left that behind or that's just in the past. No, that's every single day you're waking up and you're putting on the full armor of God. Every single day. That's why uh, Paul, in a sense, you know, it's like what Paul says, I die daily. Because if you're a soldier, in which I know, Ms., you know Pat, you were in, you know, in, the, uh, in the military, you go to the front lines, you have the mindset that you may not come out alive. You have that mindset. You know that, you know what, today could be that day. Well, as a believer, we live every day unto the Lord, not knowing if this is our last or not. not like, this is not a, you know, a, a sad you know, a sermon or something like that. that it's just that we don't know. So we live every day to the fullest. We live every day for the Lord because of the fact that we don't know how long we have. And we want to, you know what, we know that we're in a fight and we're going to go in there and say, you know what, today could be the day that, you know, that I'm taken out. But I'm going to live every single day. I'm all the way to my dying breath. I'm going to, you know, live it unto the Lord. 
And that's what we need to realize. The re, you know, as we talked about before, the redeemed are engaged in the spiritual warfare. Our enemy, the devil, is powerful, relentless, determined, and relentless. Remember, you know, that we are to stand. We are to take that, you know, that position of that we are, we're, we're not going to give up an inch to the devil. That we are to stand because you know why? Because when we got saved, all the stuff that the devil had on us is now ours. Everything that he took from us is ours. Why? Because Christ is the victor. When, you know, when, we, when we got saved, Christ said, you know what? This is all the stuff that I'm going to give you. Satan, you know, uh, kept it away from you. Satan kept it over here. It was on, you know, and he kept it away. But the thing is that when you got saved, Christ says, you know what? Here's all this, you know, here's everything you got when you got saved. So that's why he says, you know, not to give place to, you know, to the devil because we don't want to give it back. We shouldn't give it back. And so God has given, you know, uh, people some very precious ground that we need to, you know, to realize. And we talked about this before, that we have the truth of who he is and of how he loves us. We know who he is and the fact that he loves us. Why? Through his word. That's how. I mean, that's how. It's not why, but how he loves us. We have his church. We have his word. We have his spirit. We have his grace, his salvation, his blessings. And we have so much more besides all of this. And we shouldn't be so willing to just lay down and just say, okay, just go ahead and take it. But we need to get up put on the full armor of God and say, you know what, I'm going to do this. So when we get up, you know, we're, we're sitting there going, you know what, I'm standing upon God's word. I need that stability of the belt of truth, that breastplate of righteousness. I, you know, I'm just, all the pieces, you know, we just remind the fact of what God did for us to save us. That's basically what Paul is talking about. Every single aspect of salvation, you know, that we need to realize in that, that no matter what, that we are to stand and uh, that when we go, uh, into these things and so that we are told that obviously in this that the sword of the spirit is the word of god the sword of the spirit is the word of god we have this is the one of the things that you can physically see right you can see this all the other stuff you can't see all the stuff is you know other stuff is kind of like on you to realize those things but you can see the word of god the word of god is here right in front of you so you can actually, you know, read it, know it, believe it, memorize it, and live it out, right? So let's look at, you know, the, uh, obviously the sword of the Spirit, which is in verse uh, 17, the, uh, verse 17, the latter part of it. Let's look at the identity of the sword. There are actually two, uh, two types of swords spoken of in the New Testament. I think we talked about, you know, uh, you talked about, you know, one that basically like the devil would use, which would be like this one, which is once, you know, the, the one that speaks of that long, broad sword, the one that's like three to five feet long. He takes those big sweeping blows as he uh, goes by, you know, and we think about those things, but that's not the one that's used here. The one that is referred to here is, is smaller than that. It, it ranges anywhere from six inches to, uh, to a foot and a half or 18 inches long. And you say, well, that's not really a long sword. It's not... You know, it's like, I'd rather have the longest one. Well, the reason why it's, it's, it's like that is because it's for hand-to-hand -hand combat and to be able to be uh, used very quickly. When you have a broad sword, it's heavier, and so it takes a while for you to get around and do everything else, but you're able to be faster when you have a shorter sword. Right? That, you know, um, the typical strike that you would make with this, uh, with this uh, sword would be an abdominal, in the abdominal area. The reason why, in that day, Abdominal wounds were nearly always fatal. When you're that close in hand-to-hand -hand combat, most of the time, combat you're, you're, they're trying to go for the you know for the stomach. They're trying to go for the the abdominal area because, like I said, that's the area where people would um, would be considered you know uh, to be you know near fatal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so these swords they actually look the same. They look similar. If you're ever to see one, you know, this sword, the short one's called a, a, a gladius. It's called, you know, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the gladius sword. But the other one, which is the, uh, uh, the spatha, is actually longer in it. And that's the one that's three to five, you know, three to five feet. The other, this one is, like I said, six inches uh, to 18 inches. And that's the one that's obviously, you think about it, if you have a three to five foot sword, isn't it going to be heavier than a sword that's six inches to, you know, a foot and a half? But you're going to be able to be faster with it. You're going to be able to get in there and, and go. So, obviously, you know that um, he, 
um, the reason, you know, he's thinking of, Paul, when he's talking about this, is thinking of the short sword carried by every Roman foot soldier. It was a soldier's principal weapon in hand-to-hand combat. That's how God is, 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 is talking to us. This is the same sword, the same kind of sword that Peter used to cut off the, hear, uh, cut off the ear of Malchus. Uh, the servant of the high priest when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then Jesus goes over, heals his ear, and says, those who live by the sword die by the sword, right? It was this type of sword that Herod's executioners used to martyr James in, in Acts, chapter two, or Acts chapter 12, verse 2. The short sword was an in- indispensable component of the Roman soldier's army. He used it to defend, uh, defend himself and to help accomplish many day-to-day uh, tasks around the camp. The sword Paul has in mind is not, the, not obviously, is not a physical sword. We know this. Paul identifies the sword as the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. So, uh, obviously, this right here, even though you can see it, is a spiritual weapon. The Bible is a spiritual weapon. Yes, you can see it and everything else, but it's a spiritual weapon. It's not a man-made book. The Bible, uh, the, the Bible came. Uh, sorry, the Bible is the spiritual that, that came to us from the Spirit of God. We see this in Second Timothy chapter three, verses sixteen and seventeen, that says, "All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, and for reproof, and for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works." Now, when we read that list, we don't. You know, we like the fact that it's profitable for doctrine, but we don't like it when it comes down to the fact of reproof or correction. Because we like to think that we're right. We don't want reproof. We don't want correction. But that's what God, God's Word will do. It inspects us. And we like the you know, fact of instruction and righteousness, but we just don't like that middle pair you know, of how it comes in for correction and for reproof. But if we don't have those two, then we can't be perfect. Uh, you know, we can't be uh, perfect, thoroughly fur- furnished unto good works. Second Peter chapter one verse tw- uh, twenty one says, uh, "For the uh, for the uh, for the prophecy came uh, came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men uh, holy men of God spank as they were moved by the Holy Ghost." So that's how we got the word of God. Obviously, you know that the uh, the holy uh, the Holy Spirit moved upon them to write God's word. We don't have this anymore. Why? Because the canon of Scripture is closed. The canon of Scripture is closed. There's people out there that feel like they can rewrite Scripture because we have you know, different cults out there and different uh, other religions that say, oh, you know, God gave us another testament like the Mormons talk about. Or, you know what, you should read this magazine like the, the Jehovah's Witnesses you know, teach. But God's word, the canon of scripture is closed whatever you know it's been it's settled in heaven and you know what and that's what we need to go by is what god's word says not you know try to um explain away verses that we don't like if there's a verse that we don't like who needs to change we do but i want us to remind i just want, want us to remind remind us that the bible that you have you know the bible that i have it is the word of god it is inspired by god it's infallible and it's inerrant. It, uh, it can be trusted and it can be, uh, be believed. It's the, uh, it's the words, its words are the very words of God. In its pages, we find the truth of who God is, the truth of who we are, the very mind of God, the identity of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way to be saved, the source of all faith, help for uh, every battle we face, hope for every uh, road we travel, peace for the times of turmoil, joy to sustain us in times of sorrow, wise answers for all the questions of life, guidance and direction for all the paths we walk. I just want to tell you this. Today I'm, you know, uh, today I was, uh, you know, I was going through, I'm in uh, Leviticus right now. And some people say, well, what's the point of Leviticus? It's, it's such drudgery to read Leviticus. Wait till you get the numbers. No. But every Bible is inspired, and you know, what you can find out in there, everybody says, why, why were they, how come, like, you know, in Leviticus, it talks not only about sacrifices, but you got to wring the head, neck off of certain, you know, things, and you got to do this. 
Leviticus, honestly, when you put it in the context that every single sacrifice shows you the severity and the consequence for your sin, that's when you realize that and that Christ fulfilled all that when He died upon the, you know, when He died and and and, and rose again to forgive us, you go, man, that's awesome. And you say, it's, it's not a, a, a different salvation because Bible, all, you know, the Bible has always talked about that uh, salvation is belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, how can you say that? Because Abraham, it says what? He believed and it was counted unto him as righteousness. So what the sacrificial system was, and this is extra. This is not in my notes. You're just getting this for extra. What the sacrificial system was, was always a foreshadowing. It was always to show, uh, you know, show people you know, what, what their sin did and how severe the consequence was. Why? You live in an agricultural society where you have animals and you're killing your animals because of something that you did. But belief on the Lord Jesus Christ was always the way of salvation. That was always the way. Then you go on into the different parts, you know, in Leviticus, and you read these things and you're going, why does he talk about leprosy so much? Why does he talk about this? Why? And you, and you sit there and go, and you read those, and that's what doctors have used over the centuries to figure out things, is the Word of God. So when people say that, oh, the Bible is just a spiritual book, you know, it helps out with medical. It goes through all that. It goes through the fact of showing you the severity of your sin, but it also, you know, tells you, um, you know, the civil, or, you know, there's a civil law and then the moral law. Like it says, you know what, it's not a good thing for you to see your aunt naked. It's wickedness. That's what one of the things that it talks about. Do you think that that's a good thing to keep? Because you'll have people sit there and say, well, the Old Testament, it doesn't matter anymore. What's whatever is in the New Testament? Does it talk about that in the New Testament? No, it doesn't. But the Old Testament does. The Bible is alive, and we need to re remember every single part of it. There, you say, well, why, why you know, in the New Testament, why isn't that talked about? Because he already covered it in the Old Testament. And he says, you know what? That still applies. The only thing that does not apply is the uh, ceremonial law. All the you know, animal sacrifices of the killing. If the Bible in the New Testament says that this part is done away with, then it's done away with. Like the fact of you being able to eat bacon. The Old Testament said no bacon. The New Testament, you know, the Bible says what I have made clean, don't call unclean. So that's what we need to realize. The, the moral law is still there. The civil law you know, should be followed, but most of the time, most people don't. What's the civil law? The civil law is like speeding or the fact of like just different things you know, out there for society. Our nation was a nation built upon those things, but they're slowly ripping away all of those laws. Because why? Because they don't like God's law. The moral law should be you know, kept as well. You say, well, what's that? That would be like, you don't lie or steal or kill. Like any of those in there. So Leviticus is, you know, is a great book to read. It's a phenomenal book to read. But most of the time people can sit there and have this idea that, oh man, why do I have to go through all this stuff again? I, I, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing when we go through all those things. The, the Bible is the book, you know, to, the Bible is a book to be read, believed, loved, shared, enjoyed, and trusted. It is the Word of God. We must saturate our lives in its truth and soak in of the glories it contains. There is no other book in, uh, like it in all the world. The Bible alone is a spiritual book. The Bible alone is the Word of God. This is the number one bestseller. They can talk about, oh, this person had a bit. No, this one has stood the test of time. Amen? Number two is this. The importance. We talked about the identity of the word. This is the importance of, sorry, the identity of the sword. This is the importance of the sword. Just as a, uh, as a short sword was essential to the work of the Roman soldier, the word of God is essential to the Christian soldier. There is a word in our text that we should look at for a moment. And that word is word. In verse 17, it's a, uh, it, uses a, it uses a word, and I'm not going to you know, go off into all the Greek and all sort of kind of stuff, but it uses a word, and, but that word literally means utterance. 
There's two times, you know, two ways, you know, uh, there's two words translated word in our Bible. In the Greek, one of them is logos and the other one is rhema. Okay? The one he is speaking of in this context, sorry, I'm going to go through what the, the logos means, you know, or sorry, logos means, is this word is often used to speak about the entirety of the word of God. So the logos is the totality of God's word. It's this whole thing. The rhema is a verse or a section. So when it talks about, you know, uh, you know that it refers to an utterance, what it's meaning is it, it's the fact it's not referring to the entire Bible, but it's talking about smaller sections, verses, or e- even paragraphs of those things. I'm going to, I'm going to illustrate it here for you in a moment. Matthew chapter 4. So let me illustrate this. Obviously, this is when Jesus is in the wilderness and faces uh, Satan's temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, and we're going to read uh, through verse 11. It says, Then was Jesus led, uh, led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he, uh, he was afterwards a hungered. And when the tempter uh, came to him, he said, If thou be... Uh, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by the bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of, out of the mouth of God. And then the devil uh, 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 takes, uh, taketh him up into a holy city, and uh, uh, setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If uh, thou be uh, the Son of God, cast thyself down for it is written he shall uh, give uh, give his angels charge concerning thee and uh, in his, uh, in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou shalt dash thou, thou dash thy foot against a stone jesus said unto him it is written thou shalt not tempt the lord thy god again the devil uh, uh, takes him up into an exceedingly uh, exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto them, All these things will I give thee, if thou uh, wilt fall down and worship me. Verse 10. Then saith uh, Jesus unto him, get thee, beh- uh, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil uh, le- uh, leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So what we see in here, and we're going to go through it you know, here in a moment, is that we're going to see this quote-unquote rhema. This is the reason why I don't like doing like word studies and everything else, because oftentimes people go, you know, focus so much on that word that they miss you know, the entire point of it as far as you know, uh, what I want to see. But Jesus, every time, every time that you know, uh, an attack comes, he responds with what? Scripture. So obviously in, in, in four, uh, Matthew 4.4 4 says, Jesus, uh, you know, uh, it says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When Paul uses the word, word, here, when he talks about, you know, the, um, you know, by, uh, but by every word, he is using the word, you know, rhema in this one. When Jesus says every word, uh, every word of God, he is referring to the whole Bible. He's not, sorry, he is not referring to the whole Bible, but he is spe- uh, being specific, or sorry, he's, but he's pointing to specific individual sections of the Bible. Well, think about it. Think of the Bible as a vast armory, all right? In that armory, there are weapons of every size and description. These, uh, those weapons are uh, designed for specific types of battle. You may have heard it said, you can't bring a gun to a knife fight, right? That is the idea here. When uh, times of temptation or satanic attack come against you, it is impossible and impractical uh, to try and throw the entire Bible at the enemy. If Satan comes at you and attacks you, you can't just start quoting the entire Bible to him. All right? It's going to take you a while, right? Right? What you need is the specific word of God that speaks to the individual circumstance. 
That is what Jesus did. Three times he was attacked by the enemy, and three times Jesus uh, stepped in uh, to the armory of the Word of God to select the very weapon he needed for each encounter. Jesus di uh, uh, did try to uh, re uh, repel the enemy's attacks uh, with the whole Bible. He, uh, sorry, um, yeah, he, di he didn't uh, you know, try to repel the enemy's attacks with the whole Bible. He chose the precise weapons he needed for each attack. Notice, Matthew chapter 4, verse uh, 3 and 4, it says, In response to his attack, what did Jesus, uh, Jesus chose Deuteronomy 8.3. He says, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. Because this is, uh, uh, he responds, which says, and he, uh, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed uh, thee with manna, which thou knowest not. Neither did uh, thy fathers know that he might uh, make, thee, uh, make thee know that man doth not uh, live by bread, bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of, the, out of the Lord doth man live. So in there, what does he do? He doesn't quote the entire Bible. He goes to the Bible and says, you know what, I need this for this situation. Next one he, he does, and, and uh, you know, and so in, in Matthew uh, 4 through 5, when he's talking about taking him up on the pinnacle of the temple and, you know, and saying, cast yourself down because, and he, what, what does he, what does Satan do? He uses the Bible to try and use it against Jesus. Because he says, does not your word say that he'll give charge over the, you know, over his angels and he will lift you up? And what does Jesus, you know, tell him? He goes to, De uh, sorry, he goes to Deuteronomy 6.16. And says, which says, um, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God as you tempted him in Massa. So he's using the word of God against Satan. Why? Because he's picking out the, the swords that he needs. And in verses uh, 8 through 11, where he takes them up and says, you can have all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give them to you and all this other stuff. What does he do? He goes actually to Deuteronomy 6 again, but verse 13, which says, Thou shalt, uh, thou shalt uh, fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by, uh, by his name. In other words, he just says, you know what? You can't worship, the, you know, uh, uh, that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. So, God, uh, so when uh, he's doing this, he's not quoting the entire Bible. He's taking verses. Why? Because the Bible is our weapon. He sees that vast army. So when things come against you, if you know the Bible, you've been reading the Bible, you may not necessarily remember the reference, but you know what God's word says. You can go, you can get that, that sword that you need. Right? Jesus was so familiar with the word of God, obviously because he is the word of God, right? But that he was able to select the proper rhema or the proper sword that he needed, that short sword, the one that was quicker and faster. His wise use of, of rhema in the logos allowed him to achieve victory over the devil. You will notice that Jesus did not rebuke Satan. He simply used the word of God as his sword. Three times Jesus was attacked, and three times uh, Jesus used the rhema to repel the attack of the devil. Each rhema or utterance that he said, that short portion or the verse uh, the Lord quoted, not only uh, parried the, the devil's thrust, but launched a withering attack that the, en uh, that the enemy could not endure. The Satan couldn't endure it. When the devil was faced with the truth of uh, the word of God, he had to abandon his attack and flee. That's what's going to get Satan to flee. The lesson you know, for us... I. I hope is clear that when we look at this, that we need to be so familiar with the armory, the Bible, that we know where all the swords are placed. Then when the enemy attacks us, we are able to repel his attacks with the word of God. This will enable us to stand against the assaults of the enemy. The, the Bible is a defensive weapon, as we just discussed, but it is also an offensive weapon. It allows us to take the battle to the enemy. In other words, what am I talking about? Is the fact of that the, the rhema or the utterance, like I said, it always gets confusing you know, when you start you know, trying to go through these things. But when you use that one, what is that? The utterance would be the what, what sword? It would be the Gladys sword, the one that's 6 inches to 18 inches, the one that's fast and quick, right? 
because you can't bring out the entire word. You can't begin to quote the entire word of God when you're in an attack. The attack oftentimes doesn't last a long time. If you you go into war, going into battle, sometimes you know battles only last a couple minutes, and you can't begin to you know when you're having an attack, a spiritual attack, you can't sit there and begin to quote the entire Bible because by the time maybe you get to the you know to the right verse that you need to be able to repel the enemy because the enemy is going to use verses against you, you already may be defeated. Think about it. This is what he talks about in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, For the word of God is what? Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the, uh, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of thoughts and in, uh, intents of the heart. When Satan attacks, and he will, you need to be able to pull out that sword that you need that utterance that you need to get the enemy to go. That's why it's important for us to read the Word of God um, all, you know, continually. When the Word of God is used against the devil, what is James 4, 7? Resist the devil and he will do what? Flee. When the, the Word of God is preached in the power of the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit, it transforms sinners. You don't have... Oftentimes when you talk to a sinner and you have that moment to be able to talk to him to try and bring him out of darkness and into his marvelous light, you can't quote the entire Bible to him. That's why when we go door to door, we purposefully select verses that talk about salvation to try and get them saved. Because they're not going to sit there you know, while you read the Bible to them. They're not going to do it. It invades their darkness and brings them in, you know, into the light. It enters the tomb of their dead condition and breathes life into their spirits. That's how a person gets saved. But we don't quote the entire Bible to them. We quote the verses that are going to get them saved. For the saints of God, the, uh, the living word changes sadness into joy, despair into hope, stagnation into growth, immaturity into maturity, and failure into success. Like I talked about last week, I said I was having a you know, downtime, then I came across what? Psalm 73. And all of a sudden, my spirits, you know, you know, just came up. That's what the Word of God does. We have to know, you know, where to go. The problem with many you know, in the church today is that they are not familiar with what God word, God's Word has to say. They're waiting for the pastor to tell them. They're waiting for somebody that's, you know, more spiritual to tell them. No, read the Word of God. That's why I oftentimes will tell you, don't, I tell you not to read devotionals. I tell you to read the Word of God. You say, well, I need that. No, you don't. The Bible says to ask Him and He will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is your commentator, if you want to like, you know, talk about it like that. He is your devotional. Why? Because He's going to explain things. Why would you read about how God spoke to somebody else when God wants to speak to you personally? All you're, all you're doing is reading what somebody, oh, you know, God spoke to somebody else. And who's to say what they read is actually right? Just because they're famous or they wrote a book or anything else does not mean that they know the, uh, the Bible. There are many people out there that write books on the Bible that have no idea. I mean, think about it. The news commentator, mainstream media tells us how to interpret the Bible, and they have no idea what the Bible even says. But they'll tell you what, it sa- what they think it says. So that way you go, oh, yeah, that sounds about right. No, it's not. Read the Bible. Read the Word of God. Sorry, my eyes are keep on watering. Don't worry, I'm not gonna, I'm about to cry. But I am passionate about the fact of reading you know, the, the Bible. If you look at my Bibles that I have, they have no notes. This one has like a little you know, thing at the top that gives kind of a little summary. That's about it. But most of mine have no notes in them. I used to have I used to have all kinds of study notes and everything else, but then somebody wrote up and said, "Why would you want to read what somebody uh, what God told somebody else?" God wants to speak to you, and you only. He wants to speak to you. He doesn't want you to sit there and go, "Well, so and so told me that this is read God's word and see what it says." Most of the time, people nowadays, that you know, quote unquote, have you know some sort of popularity or fame is that they take a verse, they isolate it, and make it say what they want it to say. 
Like there's a, sorry, like there's a, a Christian author by the name of Mark Batterson. He wrote a book a few years back called The Circle Maker. Do you know what that book is about? It's not about the Bible. It has nothing to do with the Bible. It's about a story that's in the Talmud. Which is, you know, uh, supposedly all the rabbinical teachings, all the teaching of the, of the rabbi, a 30-volume you know, thing that he talks about. He talks about making a circle in the ground. I won't be moved until I get this. And there's nothing in the Bible about it. It's he's reading, a, he's, he's basing a quote-unquote Christian book off of the Talmud, which is not even Christian, which calls, you know, which says that Jesus is burning in hell in his own excrement. But yet he's a Christian author, you know, writing these things, saying you should do exactly, you know, circle. It has nothing to do with it. It also says that Jesus is the bastard son of Mary. That's in the Talmud, but yet we're going to sit there, oh, we'll just bypass that. We'll go with the little circle thing he says. It's because it makes for a good book. That was a number one bestseller, by the way. Think about the shack. The book, The Shack. They made, you know, God the Father a, a woman. Oh, that's a, that's a great movie. That was a great book. That was, and you, there's a reason why they made a movie out of it because there was enough books sold that they go, you know what? This would probably make us more money. It's ridiculous. Sorry if those were, you know, I named off a couple of books that you liked. There's more I could go through. I don't have that, I don't have that much time. If we knew the word of God and the locations of these various weapons and where they are located, we would not be so helpless, nor would we be so often uh, defeated. I'm not saying that you're going to win every single battle that you go into every single day. I know that because we have good days and we have bad days, right? But may our days be less bad more of the time because we know what the Bible says and we know how to fight the devil. The only way to know the Bible and to learn the Bible where the various weapons are located is for Christians to read the Bible and to learn its contents. That means that we have to pick it up, open its pages, and learn what it teaches. We have to memorize what the Bible says. There's a reason why the writer of Psalm 119 in verse 11 wrote this, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. He understood it. The Bible is the Word of God, right? It is the source of our faith and you know, our source where we possess you know, the learning about God, about Jesus, salvation, sin, heaven, and hell, everything in life. You know the reason why you know, we know certain things, like say in medical you know, fields, is because the Bible said it first. Do you know how we knew that the earth was round? Because the Bible said it was round. The Bible, you know, not only helps us, you know, in medical fields, but it also helps us in science. It helps us in every single aspect of life. But we oftentimes discount it because, you know, scientist so-and-so, Dr. Blowhard over here says, read what the Bible says. We, we'll go to a doctor faster than we will go to God's word to find out what ailment we have or the reason why our bodies are acting the way we are. If we realize the junk that we put in our bodies and go off of what the, God's word says, our bodies would be a whole lot better, wouldn't they? Of course, the bad thing is, is you know, when they start to uh, taint the food that we have, even the good food that we have. That's why it's probably better for everyone to, a little plug, I guess, have your own garden. I'm glad my wife loves the garden. That was something that she found out a few years ago that she loves the garden. I'm glad I have some gardeners in here because they take care of all that out there. Because it wouldn't be alive if I was in charge of it. If you have a Bible, you are blessed with a precious, a precious treasure. Cherish it, read it, learn it, love it, live it. And as I read earlier, Psalm 119, do what he says. That thy word have I hid in mine heart. Hide it in your heart. Keep it in your heart. Why? Because he says, that I might not sin against thee. If we love God, we're going to remember his word. We're going to 
cherish his word. We're going to keep it. We're going to hide it in our hearts. Why? Because we know that there's a day coming where we're going to need that verse. When we get in that battle. When we have the full armor of God, you know, the devil's going to come. And we can't be coming at the devil with a feather duster. We've got to come at him you know, with the sword of the spirit. Amen?